We are going to start. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Deborah Gallant. I am the Executive Director of e for all in Berkshire County, Massachusetts, though this program is open to any and all, so we welcome you all. Um, we do a monthly program where we try to offer a level of advanced education beyond pure startup to somebody who's a little bit further along um, to give you another a look at some of the stuff we think is really important to have a successful business. What's interesting is tonight's topic or today's topic about funding sources for your small business is a class in our accelerator, a version of it, it's called asking for money. But what happens is frequently people aren't ready when they're in the first 12 weeks of the program, but they're ready further on. And that's why we put this program together. We have a fantastic presenter. I'm gonna let him give his own credentials in a moment. Raymond Lanza Weil of Common Capital. And um, just so you know, we do an hour of content about, and then we turn the recording off. We only record the first hour so that any questions that you have that you wanna ask Raymond will not be immemorialized forever in a recording, you'll have your chance to ask it. Um, and if you need to follow up with him, I bet he'll give you your con his contact information if you don't feel comfortable asking in a group situation. So um, because some of you are not familiar with e for all e for all Entrepreneurship for All um, was started in Lowell, Massachusetts in 2013. And we are now in, uh, I believe it's 11 sites, maybe 12, just opened Buffalo. Um, we have Northwest Arkansas coming on soon. Most of our sites are in Massachusetts. We have one in Colorado. But the idea here is that um, e for all helps folks start their own businesses primarily through our business accelerator, but we also run pitch contests and programs like this deep dive that offer you further education. If you are not connected with e for all in your community, we encourage you to do so and find the one closest to you and, and sign up to be on their email list. e for all is a nonprofit. That's how we can afford to present free programming to you. And we are sponsored in Berkshire County by this wonderful list of contributors. As I said, the deep dives are every month. Now, we have them all archived. This one will also be archived when it's over. So if there's a topic that you've missed from one we ran before, feel free to go back and check it out on the eforall.org uh, page. Some of the really great ones we've done recently, not that they're all not great, was hiring your first employee, which if you've never done that can be pretty complicated. We did one on getting certified as a minority and woman owned business. We've done them on negotiation skills. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about funding. Next month on June 21st is about which kind of corporate entity makes sense for me. And we're gonna talk a lot about social responsibility and B Corps because people have a lot of questions about that. We're gonna do a program in July on DEI and my small business. How do I do the right thing? And in August 16th, how do I scale my business? And we're gonna look for a, a panel of former e for all um, graduates who have scaled their business to large size and how they did it. And uh, Raymond's probably seen some of that in his, uh, in his experience funding small businesses. It can be pretty complicated to go from one or two to big. So those are the upcoming topics. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna introduce our presenter, Raymond Lanza Weil from Common Capital. Raymond is, um, one of our favorite presenters at e for all um, He always makes what seems like a daunting subject very accessible, and I'm sure he will do the same today. Again, if anyone joined late, we're going to um, have about an hour of a presentation, and after the hour of presentation, we will have um, time for questions and answers. If you have things that you need clarification on as Raymond is presenting them, do not hesitate to either raise your hand or type it in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat. And let me just say a shout out, Casey O'Donnell, our e for all Berkshire County Program Manager. Casey, turn your camera on for just a minute. He's uh, behind the scenes taking care of the technology, paying no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, we will have this recording ready for you if you need to jump off at some point and you can't wait for the whole thing or you want to share it with someone else you know, we are more than happy to have you do that. So without further ado, Raymond Lanza-Weil is going to talk about getting funding for your small business. 
Well, thanks very much, Deborah and Casey. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Oh, gosh. How about there we now? Go. How about set. if we go from beginning? How's it look now? Excellent. Thank you. Hopefully all you can see is my screen. And, and your face in a little box. And my face in a little box. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself in just a moment. I am Raymond Lonzawile with Common Capital, uh, and this is Sources of Business Funding. Uh, as Deborah said, when I had taught this to e for all cohorts, which I've done more than a half dozen times, uh, we call it asking for money. Uh, it's a huge topic that I try to scale into a one hour conversation. Um, and there's a lot I won't cover, but I am available to each of you individually uh, afterwards, in addition to the half hour of Q&A that we'll have at the end of my presentation. Um, so these are some of the learning goals today. Uh, we wanna talk about the variety of types of funding sources. Uh, and really help you become more comfortable asking for money. I'll be focused on loans because I'm a lender by trade. Uh, I believe strongly that the concepts that I'll be talking about today apply to any kind of funding that you might be asking for. When you ask people for money, generally they want it back. So the ideas that go into a, a lender's approach uh, to lending money uh, apply to investors and grant makers as well. So really, I hope to unpack the mystery of a lender's or any funder's uh, decision-making process, and in particular, help you uh, be more prepared to apply for a loan. Um, it's a mystery box. I think a lot of the people that I work with uh, at Common Capital, which is a loan fund, uh, come to us not understanding what's inside this box. And that's certainly true with banks. Uh, uh, it seems sometimes as if there's a lot of stuff inside this box that nobody tells you about. Well, I'm hopefully going to open that box uh, and uh, illuminate what's inside. So very quickly about me, I was a banker for a number of years, uh, a commercial lender that is a business loan officer. Uh, and now I lead Common Capital, which is a nonprofit organization that operates a loan fund uh, that serves businesses that can't get bank financing. I'm not here to pitch Common Capital. Common Capital is one example of many types of funders uh, that are potentially out there for you and your business. Uh, and we fall under this idea uh, or this, this uh, organizational type called CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions. There's about a thousand CDFI loan funds around the country uh, serving small businesses like yours. And many of them also serve affordable housing developers and some consumer lenders. Uh, we are based in Springfield. We serve all of Western Massachusetts and we're not a bank. We're a financial institution, but uh, we, uh, we operate differently than a bank. We raise money to lend to small businesses that can't get bank financing. And we also provide ongoing business assistance to our borrowers, that is um, arms around the shoulder, coaching, advice, and mentoring, as well as hiring at our expense, not at our borrower's expense, uh, hiring experts in areas like marketing and, and bookkeeping and accounting to help small businesses uh, grow and become uh, more profitable and to thrive. Um, we're an honest broker, and you only have my word for that at this point, but you know what we want is for the community to thrive, and we believe that small businesses and, and a thriving small business community uh, is a way to help the overall economy uh, thrive. Small businesses create jobs, as you all know, uh, so by supporting small businesses, uh, we're supporting uh, the, the community at large. And to that end, if somebody comes to us and, and they qualify for a bank loan, we're going to send them to a bank. Or if we think there's another alternative lender that's a better fit, we'll send them there as well. Uh, we really try to help people find the, the kind of financing that's best for them. So when you're asking for money, and this certainly applies uh, to any source of funding, uh, and I'll have a list of those in just a moment, uh, knowing uh, what you're doing can put you in a more powerful position, in a position to leverage uh, that source of funding. Uh, so I'm a big believer in education. I'm a big believer in, as I said, opening this box of mysteries uh, so that uh, all of you, if you go to apply for a loan or other source of funding, feel more comfortable just because you understand what the people on the other side of the, the table are looking for. There's no harm in hearing no. 
Uh, one thing that I found working with entrepreneurs for, gosh, over 35 years now is that a lot of on, uh, entrepreneurs who are in the, the planning stage will take their business plan or their business idea to family and friends that know them and like them and say, what do you think? And the problem with that is that people that know and like you tend to just do a lot of nodding and they're very supportive and they want to encourage you and support you on your path. And sometimes those are the worst people to ask for feedback and advice. Sometimes the best people to get information from are the people that say no, because they really challenge you to think differently about your plan and your idea and your work. And you learn from no. You learn what is inadequate for the potential funder or perhaps for the marketplace at large. So, so knowing your business and going out and talking to a lot of people and hearing people who maybe aren't so hot on your idea, hearing from those people can be very important to really uh, tune and fine tune what you're trying to do. Knowing your business and knowing your business plan is so key. And I'll hit on that topic repeatedly over the course of the next little bit. And be specific about what you need. Don't ask for what you want from a funder, a lender, a grant maker. Ask for what you need for your business. Nobody's going to give you a gift just for the sake of giving you a gift, except maybe mom and dad or your, your, your uncle or your aunt. And on that point, here's a list of potential funding sources. I actually have three slides about this list of funding sources. And uh, I'm gonna step through this first slide, slide very quickly. I mean, it's very common for small businesses to get started just with their own money, using money from savings or bootstrapping, it's sometimes called, which can be a combination of your own money and sweat equity and taking advantage of the things that are around you, the resources that are around you to start your business, even if you don't have a lot of money. And if you need more money, sometimes that's where family and friends come in. And I just wanna caution you again that family and friends can be a good source, but they're not necessarily going to look at your business with a critical eye. Now we all have relatives and sometimes it's mom and dad, in my case, it was dad, who are hypercritical. And that can be a kind of problem too. You want somebody who's going to be constructively critical of your idea because what they want hopefully is for you to succeed, which is what you want as well. As we step through the funding sources, this is sort of from the top left down and over into the next column, sort of from easiest to hardest, sort of. Um, credit cards are a very common way for people to finance their businesses, both as a startup and in as, as a going concern. I don't recommend it. Credit cards have their place, but their place is not for long-term financing. Their place is to spend money on something you don't have all the cash for right now, like maybe an airplane ticket or or something that you're gonna repay the next time you get paid. Now, banks and credit unions, of course, are the most common source of financing for businesses. And there's a variety of government programs, both at the federal and the state levels uh, that are available to small businesses and community loan funds like uh, Common Capital. Uh, those three are sort of the core that I'll be talking about. Those are the core lenders uh, in, in this world. There's a whole variety of online lenders out there now. When I got started in this business over 35 years ago, uh, we didn't have an internet. <laughs> um, and, and what was more common, uh, the online lenders have taken the place of uh, payday lenders, uh, check cashing places, car title lenders, and pawn shops. And all of those still exist, but a lot of them have moved online. And one of the biggest cautions I want to offer all of you today is that if you seek a loan from an online lender, know that no matter how great or friendly their website looks or how many great things you've heard about them, they're going to cost you a lot more money, probably too much money. I'm extremely cautious. You should be extremely cautious about online lenders and credit cards. That's why they're next to each other on the screen. Not really. And then crowdfunding, uh, I included as an online lender because crowdfunding, sometimes that's in the form of a loan. Sometimes that's in the form of a loan that's structured to look like an investment. Sometimes it's just a grant, but not usually. The first two, the loans and the loans that are structured to look like investments are also online lenders that one should be extremely cautious about because there tends to be a lot of fine print and a lot of unexpected requirements. 
Now, again, the three, the first three things that I've mentioned that are sort of the conventional, not even conventional, but core lenders that I would expect you'd run into, banks and credit unions, government programs, and community loan funds, I'll add a fourth to that, and that's investors. Now, investors uh, are, are providing equity into your business. Think Shark Tank. If you've watched Shark Tank, you'll know that you know these people come to these uh, wealthy people and say, I want you to invest in my business. And, and those investors are buying a fraction of the business. That fraction might be 50% or 20% or 80% of a business. That's buying equity in a business. That's very different from a loan. Those investors also want to be repaid at a much higher cost and in a very different structure. And we're not gonna talk a lot about investors today because it's a very complex uh, world with just so many options. But as I said at the outset, I believe the things that a lender or an investor and an investor are looking for in many ways are very similar. So we'll talk about it a little bit. There's lots of different kinds of investors, uh, venture capitalists, angel investors, equity investors. They're all sort of the same thing, but with different tweaks in the way they do their work. If there's any investors on the line, I'm sure you could argue the fine points with me. Let's all remember we're trying to keep this sort of broad for today. And the last thing is grants. You know, up until 9-11 in 2001, and certainly up until this pandemic, grants were not something that were available to most small businesses. There were certain types of businesses that could get grants. They were typically related to disaster relief, to research and development, and to some very specific um, uh, industries and sectors that tended to relate to the military and defense uh, or to scientific endeavors. Today, in the context of the pandemic, many grants are available to many kinds of businesses to help them recover from the pandemic and continue to operate their businesses. We're not going to spend a lot of time on those today either. Again, I believe strongly that anybody providing you, potentially providing you funding, uh, is, is looking for the same kind of information as a lender. And the grants that have been available for the pandemic have largely gone away. So there's not a lot left to talk about there anyway. But on Raymond, all but, wait, before you go on, I want to just uh, almost really go back to the previous slide, which was sure. it's not what you want, it's what you need. So I'm going to use actually one of the entrepreneurs who's on the call as an E4L alum from here in Berkshire County. Um, uh, Aaron Laundry has uh, bottomless bricks. So Aaron has this birthday party business with for creating Lego brick parties, right? She let her storefront go during COVID because she couldn't have anybody there in person. Now, so let's say her new landlord, when she reopens, wants uh, the first month, the last month, the security deposit, and I don't know, it's $5,000. And she and her husband have it in their IRA. You know, they could withdraw it or they have, you know, they could borrow from their kids 529 or maybe they just have it in the bank. How do you even know how, what source, should you go into your own savings since you can only make 4% on it? If you think you're gonna get more than that, should you always use other people's money? How do you make this decision about which source to go to and whether it makes sense to do it yourself? Well, without fail, the answer every time is, it depends. <laughs> but to specifically answer the question, the, the scenario you posed, and uh, uh, I remember, it, it, Aaron, is that right? Aaron Long, right. Mm -hmm. Aaron, I remember your business. Um, the first things I'd look at are this. Number one, I would never, if you can avoid it, I would never take money out of an IRA or a 529 savings account. I might take money out of savings. And I'm amused that you said 4%, Deborah, because if you're getting 4% on your savings account, <laughs> you want to know where, right? No one's yeah, getting 4%. Absolutely. I mean, nobody's even getting 1% on their savings. So in today's economic environment, taking money out of savings makes sense because the opportunity cost, that is the, the cost of what you're losing. You're losing, let's just say for the sake of conversation, 1% interest earnings on that money, which is better than paying 5% or 10% to any number of lenders, right? So if you've got the money in savings and, and it's $5,000, I don't think that's a hard decision to make to take that money out. On the other hand, if that's your only savings, 
you know, the general rule of thumb we're taught in financial literacy courses is that we should always have 90 days of household expenses in savings as a safety net. And if you're in business for yourself, that safety net is even more important. So if you have a safety net and you have a little bit of money over and above that that you can take out to use out of savings, then maybe you finance it yourself by using your own money. But if you need much more money than that, or if you're digging into your safety net, or God forbid, digging into your IRA, your retirement, or your kid's uh, educational savings account, I would not go in that direction. I would almost always borrow the money. There is a cost to borrowing money, but the cost to borrow money in today's environment is fairly low. And, and that's true, even if it'll take a long time to to put that savings back because there's a ramp up time before you're profitable in your business. So she's going to have, I'm going to, Erin and I haven't talked about this, so I'm putting words. <laughs> in. So I don't even know if this is the case, but if that $5,000 with her projections can't be paid back for two or three years, you still think that that's a better scenario than using one of these other outside sources. Well, generally I do based on this very specific scenario and the next scenario is going to be different and I might change my tune. If a person has $100,000 in savings and needs $5,000, that's an easy answer. If somebody has $5,000 in savings and needs $5,000, I would not take that money out because now your safety net goes poof. Um, I would also, this is a good time to introduce this concept. The reason we borrow money to buy a house or a car is because if we waited to save that money, I mean, you can't buy a car today for what, less than $20,000? If I'm a wage earner, it's going to take me years to save that money up. And then I could go out and buy the car and have it free and clear. I've spent five years saving that money. Now I own the car free and clear. It's going to take me five more years to save that money again. But if I borrow that money over five years, I'm establishing sort of a balance of using other people's money at a cost while hopefully still being able to put money into my own savings account. And the value of borrowing is that you spread out the cost of that high cost asset over time and you get it now and you use it now to be productive in some way. If I'm a wage earner and I buy a car, I'm using that to get to and from work and to and from the grocery store. Now in a business, if I wait until I have $100,000 to buy a used dump truck for my construction business, I'll never make any money in my business. You need to use other people's money to spread out that cost over time in the form of a loan so that you can make that capital, that money, which you converted into a capital asset, a dump truck, to produce revenue and profit in your business. So the it depends there is, it depends how much money you need and what you're gonna use it for and all the rest of your circumstances. Thank you. Now I'm gonna skip ahead. So here's all these funding sources in text. And now here's all these funding sources in what we call the capital continuum. And this is the second of three slides in which I try to sort out which financier, which funder, which lender is best for you. Now this slide can be a little confusing. This slide is really from the point of view of the funding sources, it says at the top. And now I get to remember that I have a fancy laser pointer here that I can use. And so, this is risk as viewed by the funding source. Over here we have banks. Banks take very little risk and therefore they need less of a return on their investment or their loan to you. They're the lowest, they, they're uh, averse to risk. They take the least amount of risk and therefore they cost the least to you as a borrower. At the other end of the spectrum, we have investors they take the most risk. And because they're taking the most risk, they want the most reward. So they're gonna charge you a lot more money over time to get uh, the funding that you need. Now, this isn't a perfect continuum. Down here, we've got that bootstrapping, friends, family, using your savings. That doesn't really reside on the continuum anywhere. I mean, I guess it's low risk and low reward in that you know, if you use your own money and you can't pay yourself back, well, you're the only one who got hurt there and maybe you got helped. Um, and grants, there's really no risk with a grant. It's risky to the funder, which is why grants are so hard to get. 
the funder wants to be sure that the grant maker wants to be sure that the funding they give you is put to productive use. And so they ask a lot of questions up front to be sure that the money is going to go to serve their mission as a grant maker. But when we look at all the folks on this continuum, banks and other traditional lenders, there's a bunch of agricultural lenders that exist. They're all looking for sort of the same thing. So are the state and federal government lenders that might include the SBA, the Small Business Administration, which generally makes loans through banks and through loan funds. That might include Mass Growth Capital Corporation here in Massachusetts is a quasi government agency that gets a lot of funding from the state and relends it to small businesses. It might include lenders like us, CDFIs and other community based lenders. All of the folks on the left side of your screen are lenders. And again, starting with the banks, they're averse to risk. They take little risk. They charge very little. These lenders, the online lenders, the, the, the government lenders, and the community-based lenders and CDFIs take more risk and charge you higher interest as a result. When you get into these folks, the so-called near equity lenders, royalty lenders, subordinated lenders, they're taking on even more risk. They're gonna charge you even higher rates before you get down to the far right end where the angel capital. Raymond, I, I don't think I've ever asked you this, but I don't really know what royalty financing and convertible debt are in regards to small business. My husband I, works in finance and I know what those are for big investment portfolios. Do they really apply here? They. They apply to any business that has high growth potential. And that's something that uh, royalty lenders, near equity, sub debt, and angel investors and venture capital investors, all of these folks on the right and the upper right of the screen, what they all have in common is they're looking for growth. So if your business is a retail business, it's probably not going to be a high growth business. If you're in construction or screen printing or, or you're a locksmith, probably not high growth. Agricultural endeavors, not high growth. High growth tends to be in manufacturing, in software, in online businesses of all shapes and sizes. And those businesses that have high growth potential are the ones that have a greater opportunity to attract uh, equity capital, that's all the folks here, and to attract this quasi equity, which includes royalty lenders. And a very quick story, there was a business that was based in Springfield going back to I think 2000, or 2013 called Hit Point. They got started at, uh, with, uh, well, they got started and they, they got help in their early days from an organization in Springfield called Valley Venture Mentors, which is a cousin of e for all Valley Venture Mentors is very much focused on mentoring high growth potential businesses so that they can attract investors. And in fact, they have, Valley Venture Mentors has made investments and made investments in Hit this hit point company that was a creator of online games and hit point eventually uh, moved up to Greenfield and they needed uh, a different kind of loan than they could get from a bank after they'd attracted some equity investors and they came to us and we made them a royalty loan that is a loan that we made at a low rate of interest, but we took a high cost percentage of their top line gross revenues or royalty off the top from their sales. Um, for the privilege of borrowing money from us in what was then a very high risk situation. That was about four, maybe five years ago. And then just a couple weeks ago, after continuing to grow and create more profits, um, they sold their business to a publicly traded company called Penn National Gaming, because they, part of what they did had to do with the gambling industry. And this uh, this gambling company wants them to develop more online games for them. This is a home run and you don't see these every day. The early investors in that business got paid. Uh, the business was able to retire their debt, including their debt with us. It was a huge risk for our loan fund to make this loan. And if they hadn't sold, hadn't gotten cashed out somehow, we probably would have lost as well as all the other investors would have. But in, in return, as I said, we took royalty off the top. We got paid pretty well for the risk we took over a four, four or five year period. So in fact, um, sometimes that royalty lending can be, um, I'm just gonna make up an example, but let's say somebody does business with a big organization. 
if they're going to um, partner with you for sales, then they might see the value of keeping you alive as long as they got a royalty payment out of it. So every time those people sold a video game, right, you got you got a ka-ching, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that you're bringing up the question of incentive and alignment. And I'd like to think that all investors and all lenders that invest or lend to small businesses are aligned with that small business's success uh, and invested literally in that success. Unfortunately, you know, banks are beholden to their shareholders. So their first responsibility is to make money. Their first responsibility is not to the small business they've loaned money to. And that's at this end of the spectrum. But at the other end of the spectrum, an investor, as you just suggested, Deborah, um, is making an investment in the business. They're taking an ownership piece or something close to an ownership piece. In our case, a piece of the pie as sales were made. That's an even stronger alignment of incentive uh, to help the business do well. Where we reside in the middle as a community-based lender, a CDFI, we don't have shareholders and we're not an investor. That puts us in this middle place where we truly are interested and aligned with the success of the business. And so maybe that's a slide I should develop for some other, uh, some other presentation, Deborah and Casey, and that is not a capital continuum, but an alignment of incentive continuum. Because that's something you all should keep in mind. When you go to borrow money or ask for an investment, you have to ask yourself, what is the investor's interest in my business? Is it just to make money or is it to help me make money? Or is it some combination of the two? Well, let's go to the next slide because it gets even more interesting now. I've taken that last slide and put it on this matrix. On the left side, you've got the cost of money which rises the further up in this matrix you go, and then accessibility of the money. What's the easiest money to get versus the hardest money to get? And if this matrix is accurate, and I think it is, savings is in the lower left-hand corner. It's easy to access savings, it's yours, and it doesn't cost you anything. You're just giving up less than 1% interest. Savings, if you have it, and if you're not impairing your safety net, is the easiest money to get at the lowest cost. And at the other end of the spectrum, all the way up here, are investors. Hard money to get, and it costs a lot. And that's not to say you shouldn't go for it. It depends what your circumstances are, what the nature of your business is, the stage of your business, so many other things to decide whether or not you should seek investors. Part of it depends on how much money you need. Most investors aren't going to invest, you know, less than probably $100,000 in today's market. And many investors, institutional investors, uh, investment funds that you might run across are looking to invest a lot more than that. Coming back over here, there's a bunch of folks that are easy to get money from. Your own savings and friends and family. Friends and family may cost you more. You might have to pay interest to friends and family, or you might just have to pay for the grief of not paying them back, you know? Uh, credit cards, of course, the lowest interest rate on a credit card these days is 18% which is pretty inexpensive compared to online lenders. I was looking this up last week. I saw one online lender that was very clear that their minimum interest rate was 45%. It was in the fine print, but it was there. Please don't go to online lenders. If you hear nothing else from me today, please don't keep these people in business. They are not good for our economy or for small businesses, but they're easy. You type in, I need money tomorrow. You can probably get money tomorrow and you'll be paying for it for a long, long time and you'll regret it, I promise. Over here on the hard side, it's harder to get a grant or a forgivable loan, some of which have been available in today's uh, economy, the SBA's PPP loans, Payment Protection Program loans available to existing businesses at the uh, when the, the pandemic started. Those businesses could get loans that could be forgiven, really hard to get in some cases. Um, banks and credit unions are harder to get and cost more than savings or friends and family. They probably belong right here in the middle of this matrix. Government programs actually sometimes cost less than banks. Community loan funds conveniently, conveniently land right in the middle of this matrix. They're neither easy nor hard to get money from, and they're neither the most expensive nor the least expensive. We are the... Uh, um, uh, you know, the just right lender, in my opinion, but I'm biased and I admit it. 
Well, I'm going to keep moving quickly here because I want to get to some meatier stuff. Uh, Deborah reminded me I didn't necessarily need this slide because uh, this group that I'm talking to today, all of you, are not necessarily in Western Massachusetts. Um, but this is a good example in Western Massachusetts. The city of Pittsfield and a program in Pittsfield called PERC are available locally. In Springfield, there's a small business loan program. In the Berkshires, Greylock Credit Union is a good credit union. There's a whole bunch of banks in the Berkshires and in the Pioneer Valley of Western Mass. Um, Berkshire Bank, um, uh, uh, Berkshire Cooperative Bank, um, uh, a whole bunch of them. I mean, if there's any bankers on the line, I want you to know, I want the people who aren't bankers to know that local banks are a great way uh, to raise money for your business as opposed to national banks. I don't think Bank of America particularly cares about a business in Pittsfield or Springfield any more than they care about a business in San Francisco or TD Bank. But smaller local banks and credit unions are a part of our local economy, the fabric of our community, and they tend to be more aligned with your interests because of that. These folks on the right side of the screen are very specific to our market area here in Western Mass. They may not be applicable to all the people on this, uh, this uh, webinar today, but I want you to know wherever you are, whether you're in New Hampshire or New York or Colorado or, or Arkansas, um, there are organizations like these in your community. There are CDFIs, there are municipal loan funds, there are local community loan funds, there are local banks and local credit unions, and they all are more interested in your success than uh, big banks uh, and government programs, frankly. All right, lenders decision making. It's time to unpack the mystery box. You know, sometimes it looks like a, a box of mystery. Sometimes it looks like a magic eight ball. The lender goes in the back room and shakes the magic eight ball and says, the outlook is unclear. Well, I don't want it to be unclear. I want it to look like this. I'm gonna start up here. I'm gonna go a little bit quickly because I really wanna get to the next couple slides in the next 22 minutes. In lending, there's something called the five C's of credit. Any trained business lender is familiar with these five C's. They might talk about them a little bit differently. I'm gonna tell you about the five C's of credit, and then I'm gonna pare it down to three simple questions and two simple related topics that I think everybody will be able to understand. Those of you, Aaron, and uh, others on this call that have heard me make this presentation before, um, I. I'm sorry for repeating myself, but I hope you'll find value. The five C's of credit are a system used by uh, business lenders to gauge the credit worthiness of potential borrowers. What do lenders want? They want you to pay them back. And they decide whether or not you're credit worthy and, and whether or not they think they're, you're going to pay them back by first evaluating your character. It is the first rule of lending and it applies to business lending, to mortgage lending, to consumer lending, know your borrower. Think about it for yourself. If I came to you and asked you to loan me money so I could go buy a Stratocaster electric guitar because I want to be a guitar hero, you'd probably want to get to know me a little bit. And you'd ask questions about these five things. Are you a person of good character? How do you judge someone's character? The best way is by spending time talking to them and getting to know them. I happen to think having a meal with someone is a great way to get to know somebody's character. How does somebody treat the server in a restaurant? But the main tool we have available to us as lenders, because we don't have that much time, we can't take everybody out to lunch to get to know them, is your credit history. We pull a credit report. How you've treated other lenders in your life is a decent indicator of how you're gonna treat me as a lender. So credit history is the proxy we have for your character. And if character is the number one thing, know your borrower, then credit history is really the number one thing you need to pay attention to if you're going out and seeking other people's money. Everybody's going to pull your credit report and they're going to want to know why you have dings on your credit report if you have them. And sometimes there's a good reason. Sometimes people lose jobs. Sometimes there's a pandemic. Sometimes people get sick. But people with sloppy credit, those are not people I want to lend money to. That's not 
as someone that any lender wants to lend money to. And an investor taking an ownership piece may be less concerned about your credit history per se, but they're very interested in your character. So they're gonna ask questions as well. The second C is capacity. Capacity has to do uh, with your ability to repay. Capacity relates to cash flow. There's actually seven C's of credit. Sometimes instead of capacity, you will hear a lender talk and said it's just about cash flow. What repays a loan? Cash. Cash rules. You go out and you sell something in your business. You pay for the cost of doing business and what's left over at the end of the day is your profit. Loans get repaid from profit. We sometimes call profit cash flow. They're two different things. I'm not going to talk about the difference between cash flow and profit in this session, but there is a difference. What's most important for you to know is that you've got to make a profit. And the cash that's available from your profit is how you repay your loan. You have to have the capacity to repay your loan. If you have an existing business, any lender, whether it's me or the bank or the credit union or the SBA is going to say, how much money have you made the last two years operating your business? Oh, you've made enough money to be able to repay the loan after paying all your business costs. That's a demonstration of capacity to repay. Raymond, what if somebody is new and doesn't have that two-year history? And um, it, we've talked about this a, a lot of times before, because you have talked for us before, but it feels to me like starting financial statements and projections feel like an exercise in fiction, right? Because you have no idea whether you're going to take market share, or how many units you'll sell, or how quickly you'll be able to scale. So how do you get your arms around capacity with sort of the unknowability of a brand new business? Well, through a business plan, which I'll cover in more depth in a few moments, but at Common Capital and at other CDFIs and other loan funds, and even some banks and credit unions that engage intelligently with the Small Business Administration's loan programs, those are all available to startups. Not all startups. Not all startups can borrow money. But we finance about 25% of the lending we do uh, is we finance startups and we do loans to about, we make loans to about 30 businesses a year. Um, so do the math. What is that? About seven uh, or eight startups a year. And so how do we evaluate that? Well, when you have a startup and you don't have a track record to demonstrate capacity, all the other stuff becomes much more important. We evaluate that in the context of a written business plan. And that's what I'll talk about in a little bit more depth in just a few moments. After capacity comes capital. Capital is related to capacity. It's about your financial strength. The financial strength of your business, which we judge by evaluating your balance sheet. A business's balance sheet shows us your assets, that's what you own, and your liabilities, that's what you owe. We hope that you own more than you owe. And all of that demonstrates your capital base, your capital structure. How much money you have in the bank is part of capital. How much equipment you have is part of capital. It's a lot of things that go into capital. And capital is one of these words that has lots of different meanings depending on what you're talking about. It can just mean cash or it can mean capital equipment. As I just said, it could be a dump truck. In this case, it means all the things that contribute to the financial strength of your business at a point in time, as opposed to the cash flowing into your business. Collateral is required by almost all lenders. And those are the assets, the, the material goods of value that you pledge to the lender. If you've ever borrowed money to buy a car for yourself as an individual, you go out and you borrow money for that car and you sign over the title to the lender and that protects the lender. If you stop paying for whatever reason, the lender can force you to sell the car or can take the car by force and sell it to repay their loan. Collateral protects the lender in case everything else goes upside down. But collateral also protects you as a borrower. And I'll talk about that more in just a moment. And the fifth C is conditions. What are the market forces? that are at work that are contributing to both the opportunities and the threats that your business faces. What's the competition for your business? I asked somebody recently, tell me about the competition for this business you're trying to start. And the answer was, we have no competition. And that was the wrong answer. Every business has competitors. Competitors make us stronger. We must recognize that competitors are out there 
and we must be able to demonstrate and articulate how we're going to compete and do better than they are. Five C's of credit, which I'm now going to boil down into three questions. Uh, can, I, can I ask one clarifying question about the previous slide? If I have an incorporated business, I don't know, an S Corp, an LLC, is my personal property the pledge you want for collateral, even though it's my business doing borrowing? In the small businesses that I deal with, and in fact, 80% of businesses across the country are small, closely held businesses with either a single owner or a couple who own it or a small partnership or a small corporation. We're not talking about you know, the, the market baskets, the big whys of the world, the, the big companies. In those cases, especially when it's a single owner, whether it's incorporated or not, the business and the person are indistinguishable. As a lender, I'm making a loan to your business that may be ABC Corporation, but you're the only shareholder of that corporation or the only member of that LLC. And in that way, it's a lot like a sole proprietorship. When I lend to your business, I'm lending to you as an individual. If the business has assets to, to uh, pledge as collateral, we take those business assets. But if there aren't sufficient business assets, and I'm going to pick on Aaron Laundry and say, you know, Lego type blocks are not particularly good collateral for a lender, I might need Aaron Laundry to pledge her car or her house instead, or in addition to the Lego type blocks, because there's not enough value in those business assets. So, as I said before, Deborah, it depends. Okay. And the kind of lending we do, we frequently take personal assets if there are insufficient business assets to play. So um, for people who've been through EFRAL, um, we talk a lot about which kind of corporate entity and about getting insurance, but the reality, what I'm hearing from Raymond, and this is sort of an aha for me, so it probably is for many of you, is that because he thinks about lending to you personally, even though you have a business, he's going to ask for your car or your RV or your house as collateral. And you need to be comfortable with that. And so the court, the type of entity and the insurance issues don't get you out of that risk. But if you believe in what you're doing, this shouldn't be something that gives you, you know, keeps you up at night, but it's serious. I mean, he needs to have some, some feeling of confidence on this. I don't know if anyone else wants to check in or talk about this specific issue or, or we can go on, but I know sometimes it's a surprise that, even though you're an LLC, yes, your own house could be up for collateral on a loan. And here's why. I mean, any lender, even to a larger business, a very large business, any borrow, any, any owner of that business that owns at least 20% of the business will be required by a bank, a credit union, or a loan fund, or the government to guarantee, to personally guarantee that loan. So that's why I say that the person and the business are indistinguishable. If I'm talking about a business one, with one, two, three, or four owners, all of those owners almost certainly have at least a 20% stake. They are the business. I make loans to businesses, but businesses are backed by people. And what's the first rule of lending? Know your borrower. The borrower is both the business entity and the people behind it. Great, thank you. All right, three questions. This is kind of crude. I learned this on my first day as a banker 30 some odd years ago. Those five C's of credit boil down to this. Can they pay? Will they pay? And can I make them pay? The crude part is, can I make them pay? But can they pay? This is the most important thing. If your older brother comes to you and says, hey, lend me money so I can buy a car. You're like, hey, big brother, you're going to pay me back? And he says, of course, I'll pay you back. And you say, yeah, but you've been, been unemployed for as long as I've known you all my life, you're not gonna be able to pay me back. I'm not gonna lend you money. I pick on big brothers because I have one, but he's employed. Capacity and cash flow are the can they pay part uh, of the, these questions. Will they pay is a question of character and credit history. Your number one asset as an individual is your credit history. If you don't have good credit history, today's the day to start cleaning it up. I can't help you with that today, but it's a conversation you should have with someone. And can I make them pay? That's the collateral question. As I said, you go out and you borrow money to buy a car, the car's title is evidence that the car is the collateral for that loan. And if you can't pay back that loan, the bank's gonna come take it from you and sell the car. But the reason that collateral actually protects you as a borrower is that it's your plan B. 
Plan A, I'm gonna make money in my business and repay my loan. Plan B, if plan A doesn't work, I'm gonna sell that car or that truck or that piece of equipment and repay the loan before the bank or the lender comes and takes it from me. And in that way, you should think about as collateral as your protection in case your plan doesn't go according to plan. Ephraim so has, a, has a question about uh, getting beyond a bad credit report. Um, but do you wanna save that till later? Yes, please. Okay. So what's most important? So cash rules. Cash flow is the most important thing to a lender, any lender. You hear about collateral lenders. If you're talking to a collateral lender, you're talking to the wrong lender. That's the lender that lends you, they're called hard money lenders. They lend you money in the hopes that you'll fail and they can take your car, your boat or your house. If you're talking to a lender that's not primarily interested in your business's success and its ability to generate cash, you're talking to the wrong lender. And character is the second most important thing. Yes, as a lender, we want collateral. Yes, most lenders want collateral. Investors don't want collateral. They want a piece of the business itself. So cash flow and character are the most important things. All right, how to get a loan. We're running out of time here, so I'm gonna jump through these quickly. I wanna assure all of you, I am available by email and telephone after this at no cost to provide you with uh, guidance. And the one hour is not, not a hard step, so don't rush Great. your slides. Thank you. Um, so when you apply for a loan, whether you go to a bank or a credit union, to a loan fund, uh, to a government program that is typically accessed through a bank credit union or a loan fund, or even if you're talking to an investor, one of the first things you'll need are your historical and current financials and your tax returns. Lenders wanna see both. They want your tax returns because they wanna see what you're reporting to the government. And they want your in-house financial statements because they wanna see how well you're keeping track of your money, the money coming in and the money going out on a regular monthly basis. Those are the same financial statements that go into making your tax returns and they should look sort of the same. They never look exactly the same because tax accounting is different than, than business accounting. But if you're already in business, these are things you should have. And if you don't have these things and you're already in business, it's a little bit of a yellow flag for a lender. And you're also gonna be asked to provide a personal financial statement. Why? Because in a closely held business, as I'm certain everybody on this uh, call, on this webinar uh, has, if, you, if you're in business, um, the business and the individual are really inextricably tied to one another. We make loans to businesses, but the businesses are the people behind the business. Now, if you're not already in business, or if you're only in your first year of business, you're not gonna have tax returns or historical financials. And that's where projections come in. And we'll talk about that on the next slide, which coincidentally is right here. So when you have a startup business, you should create a business plan. What is the value of a plan? The value of a plan is putting pen to paper and saying, Here's my idea and I'm dumping it on paper and writing it out so that I can think more about it and I can create a roadmap for myself. Business plans and financial projections are extremely important, even if you're already in business. However, if you're already in business, if you have two or three years of solid profits, sufficient to repay the loan that you need from the bank or the credit union or the loan fund, you probably don't need to present a business plan to that lender. If you do, that's a bonus. In my ideal world, every business owner creates a business plan and revisits it every six to 12 months. And here, in my opinion, is the value of a business plan. It gives you a roadmap. And by having a roadmap, you can say to yourself, after you've been in business for some time, you establish a plan, you project your financials, and then three or six or nine months down the road, you take a look at where you are and you compare it to your plan, to the map that you created in, in your plan. And you say, am I where I thought I would be? And eight times out of 10, the answer is no. Sometimes you're, in a, you're, you're almost always gonna be in a different place than planned. Sometimes you're in a better place and sometimes you're in a worse place. And so one of the most important things I think you can do as a business planner and a business owner and manager is to plan 
to periodically evaluate yourself in comparison to your plan and ask yourself two really important questions. What went differently than I planned, better and worse, and why? If you periodically ask yourself those two questions in comparison to your plan that you've revised periodically over the years, you'll know how and when to adjust. Now, most business owners are entrepreneurial and most business owners are doing this naturally every day and in the course of a day. What's going differently than I expected when I woke up this morning and how do I have to adjust for it? This is actually a life lesson. We all do this in our subconscious and sometimes in our conscious every single day. With our businesses, we need to be very deliberate in writing out a plan and evaluating where we are in comparison to that plan, especially where are we in terms of the money. We're in business to make money. We're in business to provide a living for ourselves, for our, for our employees, so that we can take a vacation, so we can buy a house, so we can create more jobs. It takes money to make money. You've heard this, I'm sure. And it takes keeping track of the money to make money. And it takes comparing what you did to what you expected to do and adjusting accordingly, even when you're doing well, so that you can continue to do well, so you can capitalize on what's working. Raymond, so Raymond I, I want to take just a moment here. I know many of the folks here are recent alums of our e for all program. We do have you do the financials and projections to eight month, 18 months out. So you have a, a format, a template for a spreadsheet. We do not, however, have people write business plans. Um, it's just not a choice that if we're all made. However, all of the elements of what you put together for your final presentations are the building blocks of a business plan. There are formats, and I know that Raymond's folks and almost everybody has different templates for business plans. No one's asking you to drop everything and spend the next six months writing the world's most elaborate business plan. You can usually take a lot of the information and research that you developed, your surveys, the financials, the marketing plan that you developed, and work it into a format we do not spend time doing that early on in E4All because we have you get ready for final presentations instead. But I think that the dividing line here is if you want to use somebody else's money, it's legit for them to say, okay, show me in writing how you're going to make this work. So that's what they're asking you to do. But it's not starting from scratch. It's building on what you've already done. And it's not that hard. Raymond, do you want to tell the story of the guy with the the cement mixer or the, the driveway paver, paver from Holyoke paver. who you gave money to? I will in just a moment. And we don't give money, we lend money, but oh, sorry. sorry for being specific. Um, I will at the end of this these notes, business plans don't need to be fancy or extensive. They don't need color glossy photographs or fancy covers. They need to be a brain dump that's organized and readable of what you already know and are thinking about. And there's tons of outlines out there. We have one that I can provide, um, but it's just a way of getting what's in your head to explain to your potential funder or lender or investor what it is you intend to do. And in so doing, you need to know your business and know your numbers. As I said, this is about making money. So Carlos Rosario was in the EFRAW cohort in Holyoke uh, last year, about this time last year is when I met Carlos. And Carlos had worked for a couple of decades for a road paving company. Um, he knew how to pave roads. He saw in his community in Springfield that there weren't really that many residential pavers for driveways and such. And he decided he wanted to start his own business as a residential paving company. He went through e for all and then he came to us for a loan. He brought capital to the table. He already had some of the equipment he needed. He brought experience to the table, which is part of that's human capital, right? He'd been doing this for 20 years and having acquired some of the capital equipment he needed to do driveways, he'd already done some jobs on the side. He knew what it would cost to do a job. In fact, he'd written that on the back of a piece of paper. He, on the front of the piece of paper, he had a, a list of leads 
And really, he just handwritten this on a piece of notebook paper. He had John Smith and Jane Doe and somebody else and their phone numbers and the size of their driveways and when they wanted to get the job done. And on the back of the piece of paper, he costed it out. He said, well, for a driveway of this size, it's going to cost me this much and here's what I'm going to charge. And he had three or four different examples. He did not have an extensive, he didn't have any business plan, frankly, and he did not have written projections, but he had gone through e for all that speaks volumes to us. People that complete e for all and other similar training programs have demonstrated character and commitment in a way that frankly credit history doesn't even come close to explaining. And because he had the experience and the capital equipment and the plan in his head and he'd finished e for all we worked with him to develop the projections uh, with him. And to say to him, does this look like what you had written on the piece of paper? Now it's in a spreadsheet. These are your numbers. And we worked back and forth with him and with an outside consultant. And we were able to make him a loan to start his small business, Rosario Paving of Springfield. If you're in the Pioneer Valley, especially in the Springfield area, and you need your driveway paved, you should call him. He's an E for all alum. So I think that's a great example. And thanks for queuing that up, uh, uh, Deborah. Transparency is the last item on this page. I cannot emphasize this enough. Lenders and investors, even mom and dad, if they're your lender or your sibling, no lender or investor likes surprises. When you go to apply for funding, whether it's a grant, a loan, or an investment from an equity investor, you must be transparent. Warts and all. We want to know everything. We want to know everything, not because we're nosy by nature, but because we want to understand the risks. We want to understand the opportunities. And the more transparent and clear and upfront you are about the hard stuff, that tells us two things. That tells us, number one, what we should be looking for. And it's a demonstration of your character. People that come to me and say, like the guy that said, I have no competitors and I'm going to be successful because I'm going to make money but didn't really tell me how he was gonna make money in his business, which I, I, I mean, I'm not telling you what the business was, but he had a business that we would all know and understand, but he didn't articulate how he was gonna be different from the other businesses. And he didn't articulate what the challenges were. Maybe he didn't know, but if he did know, he was not transparent about it. And I was not interested in hearing more about that business, frankly. So when you're applying for a loan, you need to know what you need, first and foremost. People that apply to us and say, I need growth capital. We had a pizza shop owner say that, hey, I've had a pizza shop for two years and I wanna grow my business. So I wanna borrow $50,000. That didn't really tell us anything. That's what he wrote on the loan application, grow business. He knew how much, $50,000, but he didn't tell us how he knew what he needed. What he really needed was marketing dollars. He wanted to do a bunch of advertising and get flyers out in the community. And he wanted to print a bunch of menus that could be distributed. He wanted to do social media marketing. He wanted to do all these things related to advertising so he could generate more sales. That's what it meant to him to grow his business. Totally legit. But what he should have put on the loan application was, I need to borrow $50,000 to engage in this advertising and marketing plan with these elements. And here's what they will each cost. And here's the difference it will make to my business. If I can advertise this much, I'll grow my revenues by this much. And I'll be able to repay you. If you, one of the, one of the people in an e for all cohort had a, a t-shirt uh, screen printing business, and he was talking about buying more screen printing equipment. Well, Let's take that as an example. What do you need? I need equipment. How do you know you need it? Well, my order volume exceeds the number of t-shirts I can print in a week. So I'm losing on, on opportunities to generate more sales. If I had more t-shirt printers and more employees, I could meet that demand. I know this because I'm turning away business. What difference will it make? Increased revenues, increased gross profit, increased profit. How you repay from that increased profit. What's plan B? Gosh, if it turns out it was just a fluke and everybody was buying t-shirts because of the damn pandemic, excuse my French, and now I don't need so many pieces of equipment anymore, I'll sell that equipment as part of my plan B. Very quick examples about what 
uh, lenders are looking for and what you should be looking for. If you borrow money, you should know what your plan B is. Oh, I guess the cursor's over there. What's my plan B? You should know the answer to all these questions before you ask someone for money. And if you don't know the answers to these questions, you're probably not ready to borrow. All right, just a couple more slides. Well, if you do all that, hopefully you get results. And this, when I first found this stock photo, I thought, won't it be great if somebody just dumps a bunch of money on your desk and you can use it in your business to make more money? And that's really the point. The result isn't just getting the loan or the investment or the grant. The result is that you're going to put that money to work in your business to make more money in your business endeavor. That's what this is all about. The end game isn't getting the loan or the investment. The end game is putting that money to work to do what you know how to do. I'm gonna leave this slide up for just a second. This is how to reach me. That's my cell phone. You can text me, you can call me, you can email me anytime, day or night. I promise I turn my phone off when I don't wanna to talk to people or when I'm sleeping, which is usually the same thing. Raymond, you're also going to make these slides available, right? So you'll send them to Casey or I, and we will email them out to everyone. Absolutely. And I'm going to take this down in one second so we can see everyone's pretty faces. Going once, going twice. If you don't write it down, you can always get it from Deborah or Casey. By the way, I forgot to introduce my interns, Fozzie Bear and Kermit the Frog. Some of you might be wondering what's this finance guy doing with a couple of Muppets on his shelf. I'll tell you sincerely, this is serious business. Your businesses are likely your livelihood. And I take that very seriously. And it can be stressful to run a business. It can be stressful to lend money to businesses. So I try to keep it light when I can. But this is, this is hard. What you're doing is hard running or starting a business and borrowing money or getting an investor is hard too. And I hope what I've told you about today makes it a little bit easier. And if it didn't make it any easier, then you should call me and we should talk. And now I'm ready for your questions. And should we start with the credit history question? Deborah? Yeah, let's start. Let's start there. I think the question was, how do I improve my credit history? I think, uh, Ephraim, do you want to make uh, make this a little